Hello everyone! For today's video, I have three theories I choose to discuss. I choose these theories enable us to grow and to understand better this topic. I hope at the end of this discussion, you have something you learn and also I hope you understand better. But before of that, I would like to introduce myself. I am Melcher Pancho Bungulto, a second year college taking a Bachelor of Arts in Communication at Partido State University, Goa, Camarinisur. So, our first discussion will tackle about the Communication Accommodation Theory. It was first introduced back in 1973 as the Speech Accommodation Theory. It basically means we change conscious or unconsciously our way of communicating towards different people based on situation we are in. This theory was developed by Dr. Howie Giles, a professor of University of California, Santa Barbara, who states that we human, we feel the need of adapting the different environment in that we do so by accommodating to others in how we write, speak, or even dress. I have here short edited video to discuss Dr. Howie Giles some questions regarding communication accommodation theory. So Dr. Howie Giles is a creator of communication accommodation theory. So this first question, Dr. Howie Giles, would you summarize communication accommodation theory? Well, as social animals, we need to adapt to our environments. And one of the ways we do that is as communicators to adapt, accommodate to each other, be it in dress style, be it in speech, be it in texting. Uh, and sometimes we get closer to each other in our communications. Other times we move away from each other to varying degrees. And so the theory really is all about addressing when we do this, how we do this, how we make our adjustments, why we make our adjustments, uh, and the social consequences of making those adjustments. Dr. Howie Giles, I'm just curious, how did you get started coming from your first state? How we become more similar or different somebody else is communicating with you? Well, it all started, I guess, first day at grad school. Uh, my mentor said, you need a theory. So I had to think, what can I theorize about? <clears throat> and I'd had a long history of accent mobility, shall we say. Because uh, I was born in Cardiff in Wales uh, and was very interested in sports and used to go to a soccer stadium and a rugby stadium and my voice would dramatically change in each place. So in a soccer stadium, I talk a bit like this, you see, and it all be the non-verbals that go along with it. Mm. And But when I'd go to a rugby game, it became a soft lilt. When I went to college, there was a very different Welsh accent up there, which is very deep and very serious very little mouth movements. And so I became tridilectal, if you like. Uh, my friends there were mostly from London, so I used to speak like this as well. So I used to think, am I crazy? Am I a linguistic chameleon? Um, does everybody do this, or why do they do this? It seems a, an interesting phenomenon. And so the theory started uh, in that way. And so I thought, wow, people come together, people move away. How is this? Is it important? Uh, and so the theory began to articulate that in terms of accent to begin with, and then it branched out to other forms of communicative behaviors. So somebody was developed the cut. I'm just curious personally, in this always in your mind, I am accommodating how I'm accommodating or there are times you turn that off and you are just kind of who you are. Good question. And I think for most of the time, I turn it off. Otherwise, I would drag myself crazy. Uh, in the same way that I'm an intergroup communication person, I see things in intergroup terms. If I live my life constantly monitoring that, again, I would drive myself crazy and I think would become too strategic, too overthinking events. But there are some uh, instances where I think maybe this situation demands some accommodation or this situation demands me to be divergent and emphasize my identity. Uh, as a, a member of a particular group, um, be it British, be it academic, um, be it older, 
whatever it is. So it, it, it goes in like a figure ground, uh, if you like, for me personally. Thank you very much, Dr. Howie, guys, for answering those questions. My pleasure. Our next discussion will tackle about the reinforcement theory. So from the word reinforcement theory, it is the process of shaping behavior by controlling the consequences of the behavior. Combination of rewards and punishment is used to reinforce desired behavior or extinguish unwanted behavior. Any behavior that elicits a consequence is called operant behavior because the individual operates on his or her environment. Reinforcement theory concentrates on the relationship between the operant behavior and the associated consequences and sometimes referred to as operant conditioning. Reinforcement theory is psychological principle maintaining that behaviors are shaped by their consequences in that accordingly, individual behaviors can be changed through rewards and punishments. One effective way to motivate learners or co-workers is through positive reinforcement, encouraging a certain behavior through a system of praise and reward. For example, the class is rewarded with extra recess when all students pass the exam. So as you can see, positive reinforcement can be used in a range of settings and situation to teach new skills and encourage people to do their best. And it can be as simple as telling someone good job or you did great, something like that. It is because positive reinforcement is a practical way to put psychological principles to work in everyday life as a great result. It can improve confidence and self-esteem and encourage self-reliance. Our last discussion uses and gratification theory. It was first introduced in the 1940s as scholars began to study why people choose to consume various forms of media. For the next few decades, uses and gratification research mostly focused on the gratifications media users sought. Then, in the 1970s, researchers turned their attention to the outcomes of media use and the social and psychological needs that the media gratified. Today, the theory is often credited to J. Blumler and Alejo Katz work in 1974 as media technologies continue to proliferate research on uses and gratification theory is more important than ever for understanding people's motivations for choosing media and the gratifications they get out of it. Uses and gratifications characterize people as active and motivated and selecting the media they choose to consume. The theory relies on two principles media users are active in their selections of the media they consume and they are aware of the reasons for selecting different media options. For example, the needs of a particular person are met through the media use. Some people might watch news for information, some for entertainment, and some for self assurance and some watch according to their moods. So there are various needs which get fulfilled by the media. So that's all for today. I hope every one of you, you understand my discussion which is communication accommodation theory, second reinforcement theory, and the last, the uses and gratification theory. Again, I am Melcher Pancho Bungulto from Bahom Tubi and thank you very much for listening. Keep safe everyone.